You know, anytime you come to the end of something, we're going to make a, a really uh, um, revelatory statement. You ready, Rob? When you come to the end of something, something else starts. You know, and, and, and depending on what type of person you are, depends on which one you focus on. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Is your glass half empty or is it half full? Uh, am I going to focus on what I didn't get done or what I have the opportunity to do? And the right answer to that, in my opinion, is yes. I'm going to focus a little bit on both. Because I need to see what I had set for myself and what I achieved and what I didn't achieve and what I need to carry over and what I need to do next. The problem is so many times we come to the end of a, a year and we start making year, near, New Year's resolutions. I am not a New Year's resolution guy because I think 99.9999% of the time you're just lying to yourself anyway because one calendar day is not going to change your behavior. Starting January 1st, I am going to diet and lose weight. No, you're not. <clears throat> now, if you start January 1st and you do January 2nd, January 3rd, we always laughed at the gym in January, it's packed. You can't get a machine. Just wait till February. It'll be back to normal. You know, everything will be. So my, my thing going into the new year is beginning to look at and to evaluate what did I do right? There were some things last year that I did really well. I did okay. Those are behaviors I need to continue what are some things that I didn't do so well? There were areas in my life that I fell short. I need to improve those. But the, God set up some things and he said that there are some things that you need to do going into this new year. And in my life and in the life of the ministry, there are some things that we need to put away and not carry with us. And this is a great opportunity to do it. It's a great opportunity to do it. One of the things we get to do this year is from this place, on May the 4th, this place, there'll be gospel preached from this place for 100 years. That's pretty cool. 100 years the word of the Lord has been taught from this place. This building is 100 years old on May the 4th was their first service. There were, I'm going to look it up, I've, I've got all their ledger books, but I think there were, were 10 people at the first service and their offering was $1.50. May 4th, 1920. And uh, I, 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 I did a funeral this week uh, of my great aunt. And what I didn't realize was all the way through the late 60s, uh, 70s, and into the early 80s, I had family here. I didn't know that. My aunt and uncle were part of this church uh, for a long time. Uh, and I went back through some of the ledger books and found their names. Uh, they lived, lived here in Stonewood for, uh, for many years. And, and I went and I said, God, it's not an accident that you gave us this place. So what can I do moving forward? What can this ministry do moving forward to make the effect on this area that you want us to make? Because if God places you somewhere, he places you there for a reason, right? He doesn't just do things by accident. I know Heather and Etika sat over Friday and talked until, I don't even know what time it was, uh, just on things like, what can we do to reach the community? What are some of the things that are needed right here, right now? Some of those things we're going we're gonna to throw out to you guys on ideas, on things of, of how we can reach in and we can meet the needs of the area. Now understand this, when I ask you for an idea, we're all real good at coming up with ideas and problems and all that. I'm going to ask you for the solution too. So when you give me the idea, I'm going to say, what role do you play? Because one of the things that really is going to hit and be a mark moving into the new year is we have to up our personal involvement. We have to decide where we are. And everybody's shouting me down. We have to decide what is the sacrifice that I'm willing to make for the kingdom of God. 
That's one of the things because being a Christian is a sacrifice. Being in the ministry of any type is a sacrifice. It requires something of you. One of the first things it requires of you is your time. One thing I learned a long time ago, Pastor Frank, when I took that role of pastor, my time was no longer mine. They said, personal time, what in the world is that? It doesn't exist. You know, there are some of you who have jobs and roles that it doesn't matter where you go, they refer to you as who, what you do. They refer to you as your job. And they always want to ask you questions. They always want to present their problem and their situation to you because you have this title. Well, we also carry a title, each one of us, and that title is a child of God. So we represent that at all times. So one of the things that I was looking at going into this new year, I said, God, what, how, how can we, can we uh, enter this thing the right way? Colossians chapter 3 is where I wound up. We're going to start in verse 1. And God began to look and he says, I'm going to teach you how, to be, how not to behave, but I'm also going to teach you how to behave. You know, Rob, we're real good at telling people what not to do. But I'm one of those guys that says, if you tell me what not to do, tell me what to replace it with. You know, I don't, I'm not looking for a void. I don't need something else to figure out, Jimmy. I've got enough stuff to figure out. So I'm not, I'm not asking God to trick me here. I said, if you don't want me to do this, what exactly is it that you do want me to do? And that's why I love this passage of scripture so much because he said, don't do this, but do this. Are you ready? Here we go. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, there's your word, Rob. You ready? Therefore, Put to death your members. Wow, he's getting tough here. He's looking at us and he's saying, Donna, some things have got to die. That just doesn't sound pleasant, does it? But God's going to give you the opportunity to kill some things, to let some things die. The member which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, Passion, evil desires, covetousness, uh, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons uh, of disobedience. Remember, we've talked about and we've concentrated for the last two months on one word. Obedience. We looked at the miracle of the holidays. The miracle of the Christmas season was all based off of obedience. Obedience. So God's looking at us, and he said, there's some things that have to die. Your desires, the things that you want, the things that you go after, the things that you covet. The, the, listen, the things don't matter in the grand scheme of things. What of it can you take with you? The things that we search after the things that we seek after, the things that we put all of our time into, what goes with you? We spend the majority of our life going after wealth, right? Whether that's stuff, uh, whatever that is. Can it go with you? Can you take that with you? No. No. But there are some things that you can carry into eternity with you. On the great judgment day, God says, uh, hey, I knew who you were. Come on in and rest. You did good. And then there's going to be those that said, listen, we did all this stuff, God, in your name. And he looks at him and said, but I didn't know anything about you. 
I didn't have a relationship with you. So if that's the case, the most important thing that we can learn, the most important thing that we can do moving forward is understand that as our relationship with God is of the paramount, most important level of anything. Anything is your relationship with God. You want to improve your relationship with your spouse, with, your, with, with the people that you're with all the time? You want to improve that relationship? Improve your relationship with God. I know that when my marriage is rough and I'm going through stuff, I do that too, in case you didn't know. I, I've been married 32 years and at least 31 and a half of those have been blissful. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> through the process... I can mark the times that we struggled in our marriage was the same times that I struggled with my relationship with God. They're directly related. When I put away my word and I wasn't reading my word the way I should, when my faith was shaken, when I wasn't firm on who I was as a man of God, when I wasn't firm in that, I wasn't firm in who I was as a husband. I wasn't firm in who I was as a father. I begin to focus on stuff. I begin to look and say, I've got to work harder. I've got to work more hours because I need to provide for my family. I need to do this. I need to do that. And the wrong word was there was need. The only thing I needed to do was have a strong relationship with God. Because in having that strong relationship with God, Ben, he says, then I will guide and direct your steps. So all the stuff that I was trying to produce, he had already done if I would have just worked on my relationship with him. Because when we're having that conversation, he would have looked at me and he would have said, do this. Instead of me beating my head against the wall. God says, put those things to death. That's a strong word, Kathy. Kill it. That means it breathes no more. Root it up, throw it in the fire, and do away with it. So going into this next year, the one thing that I need to focus on is I need to focus on dying to me. So that I can live through Christ. Because that's really what matters. That's where it's all at. It says the wrath of God's coming. Let's say verse, uh, let's go to verse eight. But now you yourself are to put off all these. See, he already told us the fornication and all that. And then he says, I'm going to go even farther. I'm going to work on your personal personality traits and the way you deal with people. Get rid of your anger. Do you realize that 99.9999% of the time anger is rooted in self? Somebody did me wrong, I'm mad. That's where anger comes from. Now, there is a righteous indignation that's a different animal. I'm talking about the majority of the time when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, when I'm mad, it's because someone inconvenienced me. God said, quit it. Grow up. It's not worth it. All the anger is going to do is hurt you and hurt your relationships. If you're that irritated about it, get up and do something about it. If you're irritated about it, fix it. If you're irritated when you go to the underwear drawer and there's no underwear, go wash clothes. Don't get mad about it. Just get up and do something about it. Wow. This is a lot harder than I expected it to be, Amanda. I expected this to coast today, but God's not letting me coast. Get rid of anger. Wrath. Wrath is what? Acting on anger. Don't do it. Put it away. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy language. Oh, Lord. That filthy language just doesn't mean you cusseth. Filthy language is corrupt communication. Anything that is anti-God, gossip, filthy language, backbiting, filthy language, murmuring, favorite word, filthy language. Do away with it. Why? Because it's cancerous. 
It's cancerous. It is spiritually cancerous. It will kill your spirit, man. We got to put those things away. Put it out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Whew. This old preacher friend of mine used to always say, forget you're a Christian for a minute and tell the truth. Don't lie. You, there's no reason to live in a lie. You go to the doctor if you're sick, don't tell the doctor you're fine. You tell the doctor what you got so the doctor can help you. Well, we have the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the great physician. We lie to him. You got an appointment with the best doctor ever in history, and you won't tell him what's wrong. You want to look cute. And then we wonder why the miracle hasn't taken place in our life yet. Quit lying about where you are. Tell the truth about who you are, where you are, what you are, so that we can start and move forward. We can go to the next place. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Wow. All of a sudden, God said, stop doing that. Now, here's what I want you to do. Verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God. Therefore, as those who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's everyone in here, yes? If not, let's fix it now. Okay, so we're, I'm dealing with the elect of God. Some of you don't see yourself that way yet because I'm getting these looks. You are the elect of God. If you can't do anything else, telling yourself every morning when you look in the mirror, Pastor Frank, I am the elect of God. Whew. That'll change the way you approach your day. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, you ready? This is how you're to behave. You ready, Rob? This is, there is a test. There is. I promise. It won't be a written test, but God will test this. Put on tender mercy. He told us to do away with what? Anger. What did he tell us to put on? Tender mercy. See, God didn't take anything away, Ben, that he didn't replace. Put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. One of the first things God began to deal with me going into the New Year's, it says, any unforgiveness that you have in your heart, anything that you're holding against anybody, you need to kill it before the calendar turns. Don't take it any farther. And I said, oh, God, you got the wrong one. I'm one of the most forgiving people there is. I don't hold grudges against anybody. He said, oh, really? Don't you love when God does that? Let me help you, son. Remember when? And I went, oh, yeah. Yeah, I do remember that. He said, that's a problem. Let's deal with it. There's some of us who are holding things in our heart against people that is limiting the ability of God to move in your life at the level he needs to move. You need to bring that to the altar, leave it here, sacrifice it, kill it, do away with it. Well, how do I do? Bless them. Bless them. Well, they won't talk to me. So what? Don't talk to them. Drop groceries off on their porch and leave. You don't have to go, ooh, look at what I'm doing. I'm all holy and accepting. No, this is, this is between you and God. And as you're going, if God says, now go to that one and look at him square in the face and say, I'm sorry, I held a grudge against you. Not, do you remember what you did to me? I'm going to forgive you for what? No, that's not forgiveness. That's not forgive. That's bringing up the past, and now we got to all relive it. I'm not about that. 
You know, I've, I've been to some counselors where they just want you to relive every situation. What did it smell like? What did it look like? How did you feel? I don't want to know how I felt. I already felt that and it wasn't good. Let's do something else. Let's do something. Let's pour in the oil and the wine so I can be healed over that instead of opening that wound again and doing it again. I don't want to play that. So I'm not talking about when I go to forgive these people, I'm not talking about dredging it all back up and let's have a long counseling session and let's cry on each other. I'm talking about me releasing them. I no longer hold you accountable to what I feel you owe me. They may never apologize to me, but I deserve an apology. I'm going to release them, and I'm not ever going to hold them accountable to that. Because you know what? They, I may be expecting something from them that they cannot give me. Now, who's, bond, who's bound? Who's being held in captivity? Me. God said, don't take that anymore. Release them. Forgive them. Well, do I, what do I expect? I expect nothing. But they owe me. Okay. Let God deal with that. Let God deal with that. And then if they come back, you can say, man, God, that was a blessing. Thank you. I could retire if everybody paid back to me the money they owe me. I got a car lease that's ready and I'd buy a new truck. I had somebody come back and give me money the other day. They looked at me and said, here, you loaned this. I said, what in the world did I loan that to you? That's how I want to be. I don't want to remember it. I don't want to look at that person and see that person and say, I've got to pray for them and they owe me 20 bucks. I don't have it anyway, so why am I missing it? Love you. Here you go. Don't carry those things into next year. Put them to death. Exercise mercy, loving kindness, long-suffering, patience. Oh, Lord, not patience. Do anything but patience. Thank you, Jesus. Even as Christ forgave you, think about all of the things that you deserve. I know some of you. And some of you I've known a long time. Some of you not quite as long. And some of you have known me a long time. If I got what I deserved, Lord help me. Because I don't deserve his mercy. I don't deserve his grace. I don't, I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his forgiveness. But freely he gave that to me. And he said, with that same level, I want you to forgive those around you. Even as I throw your sins, the word says, as far as the east is from the west. Kathy, I want you to start heading east and don't come back till it turns west. If I continue to go east, when does it change? Never. So God took your sins, the things where you wronged him. Because that's what sin is. Sin is wronging God. Missing the mark. The things that he's asked you to do. The obedience. He says, I'm going to throw them as far as the east is from the west. At that level, I forgive you. I don't even think about it anymore. With that same level... Forgive one another. There are some of you that I've wronged in this room. I've asked you to forgive me. Prayerfully, you have. If you haven't, take care of it. There's some of you in the room that have wronged me, or I felt that way. Guess what? God said, grow up and get over it. They crucified me. 
and you're upset because somebody said something bad. Hanging on the cross, I looked at my father and said, God, don't hold them accountable for this. They don't understand what they're doing. I mean, you think about that. Man, that was good. I was, whew, I'm going to have to go back and listen to that again. Hanging on the cross. Don't hold them accountable, God. They had beat him. Shoved a crown of thorns on his head. Ran a spear in his side. Don't hold them accountable for it. They don't understand. That level of forgiveness, forgive one another. These are the things that I need to carry into the new year. Into a new level. Into a new place. But above all these things... Verse 14, put on love, which is, get this, which is the bond of perfection. Perfect love does what? Casts out all fear. I'm not sure. I'm uncertain. I'm not comfortable. I'm moving in fear. I'm afraid. We don't understand the perfection of love. God wants us to love each other with that level of perfection that you never go, I wonder what his motives are. Can we love each other enough to never have to question the motive? Are they just trying to get ahead? Are they trying to take my job? Are they, are they, are they? We don't understand perfect love. I need to realize that you love me enough through the love of Christ that you only want to see the best for me. That's all you want to see. You want to see everything that I touch succeed. You want to see me walk in favor above everything else. And I want to see you blessed beyond measure. Not intimidated by what God's done for you. Celebrating with you when God blesses you. When you pull in in the fancy truck and I go, that's not perfect love. When God chooses to heal you and you don't have to take all the medicine anymore and I'm going, but God... What about me? That's not perfect love. To celebrate you at a completely different level and seeing what God's doing for you. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's one of the things that I have worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on in my life. And it goes through me when I talk to people. How was your day? That one question will tell me more about your relationship with God and who you are than any other question. How was your day? It was terrible. Was it? You're still standing here breathing. Might have been a hard day. Might have been a challenging day. Everything might have not gone my way. But Father God, I am so thankful for today. Rob, I woke up with your cold, man. My head full of stuff. The one thing I wanted to do was roll back into bed and act like every other Christian, pull the thing over my head and say, I'm not going to church today. That's what I wanted to do. And God said, did you not just read? And I went, uh, really? <laughs> so I got up and I went and I cut open a New York bagel because Pastor Frank loves me. 
I did. You want one? Yeah, I do. Okay, I'll, I'll get you one out of the freezer. You can have it tomorrow morning. I already know which one I'm having tomorrow morning. We'll try the pumpernickel tomorrow morning. Thank you, Jesus. And I did. I said, God, you know what? This is a good day. And I was more like this. God, this is a good day. <laughs> it was, God, this is a good day. The church service today is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be, I called Pastor Leo. I'm talking to Pastor Leo and, and we're going on. He said, man, you sound terrible. I said, no, but God's good. Yeah, I do sound terrible. It's, it's bad. I don't like this. I got a big head to be full. <laughs> but God is good. God is phenomenal. I am so thankful for today. I get up, my neck hurts, my back hurts, my knees hurt. And you know what? It reminds me I'm alive. I'd have another day to serve my heavenly father. Yes, I may have physical infirmities. I may have things that are going on in my life, but that's just one more opportunity for God to show himself faithful. One more opportunity that I get to say, God, thank you for your healing power. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for moving in spite of me. And it helps me realize God's not really relying on how good I am, how good I feel. He's just relying on me to be here. That's it. Because as long as I'm here and I'm willing and obedient, the ability for him to move here on earth is now present. Guess what? When you walk into the room, the ability for God to move in that room just took place. Because you're there. Whether or not God does is also contingent on whether you're angry or full of mercy and loving kindness. Whether you're selfish or whether you're willing to bless and give. One of the best examples I know of that is one of my spiritual heroes. Her name was Teresa Robinson. She was Pastor Rita's mom. Pastor Rita's mom was one of those ladies you're afraid to think in front of. I'm talking about a lady that moved in prophecy. She can just about tell you what you had for breakfast. I called her on the phone one time, and this was before the caller ID. This is the old rotary days, you know. Hello? And when she picked the phone up, she was prophesying as she picked the phone up. And at the, I, at the end of it, I said, this is Doug. She said, I know who it is. One day, she was dying from cancer. It was bad. She was laying on, the, on her couch. Uh, she wasn't allowed to get up anymore. I mean, the cancer was coming out of her body in wounds. It was bad. And I went into Teresa, and I called Rita and Mydra. I said, can I bring communion to Teresa? She's one of my spiritual heroes, and I love her. I just want to... So I brought communion to her, and she couldn't sit up. And we did communion, and I looked there and said, Teresa, can I pray for you? She said, absolutely not, but I'll pray for you. She said, see, right now I'm closer to God than you are. In pain, knowing she was going to die, she said, nope. Because, see, I'm getting ready to go home. you got to stay here. And they have set her up, and she laid both hands on both, either side of my face. And she prayed. And she prayed. And within days, she was in heaven. And when I saw that, to me, that was such unconditional love. Because I would have been like, yeah, pray for me. I'm hurting. I'm a baby. You will need to confirm it, ask Etika, she'll tell you. All right? I mean, you know, there was one thing on Facebook, a woman that had a C-section understands what it is for a man to have a cold. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! But see, through this process, I've had to learn what true love really is. 
what, the, what these things are that I need to begin to take with me into this new year to where I'm so thankful for what I have. I'm even thankful for what I don't have because those things I don't have just gives God an opportunity to do something else. God, I want to be known as a man that unconditionally loves you and those around me. If, if we can achieve that, nothing else matters. They have no agenda. None. Who can you say that about in your life today? Some of you are really tickling through the files and you haven't got there yet. How, how, how many of us can say, this person in my life, I know absolutely positively has no agenda? I was talking to an individual a couple weeks ago. I said, why are you not in church? Because all the, all the church wants is my money. That's the only reason I don't come. Because you preachers, all you ever do is, is want my money. Okay. <laughs> Well, but then I turned around and looked at him and said, what club do you belong to? He started naming off the fraternal organizations and the other things. And I said, huh, you paid dues? Will they let you in the door if you don't? You can come in this door and I'm not going to charge you anything. You don't have to put anything in the plate. You can eat for free. But there's so many things, and now I have to look at me. God, am I a man that is worthy of, of people putting their trust that I have no agenda? So there's some points that I have to repent over. Because you know what? There's area of my life, Lord, that I have agendas. There are times that I go to pick the phone up, and I need to get something to call, something done, and I will have an agenda when I call that person. I've got to figure out the balance. I've got to figure, am I manipulating? You know, Jimmy here gets my phone call. He goes, oh, great. What happened now? I'll still I know you will, Bay. I don't want people to go, oh, great, when they see the caller ID. Because if you're honest, there are certain people that show up on your caller ID that you're like, not now. There's some that you go to the coffee pot and make a fresh pot because you know it's going to be a while. I'm like, Reader's Digest, please. Because the story is going to be, and they're going to rehash the same thing, and you really have to decide, do I have time for this? I don't want to be that person. It should be that when my number comes on your caller ID, you go, God has something for me. That when you come across my caller ID, I go, here comes a good idea. Here comes a blessing. Or, oh, great, what went wrong now? Who's offended? Who's mad? Who's leaving the church now? No. No. But I'm joyful in the fact that no, I know that I know that I know that at the end of this conversation, I'm going to be better. Why? Because I had the conversation with you. And every conversation we have focuses around the things of God. Does that mean we don't have conversations about problems? No, that doesn't mean that. But what it means is we're actually ser searching for a solution to what's going on. Because some people like to come to my office and just use it as a dump zone. You know, there is nothing about that office that says this is the complaint center. I want to put a sign outside that says solutions here. Not that I have them, but that's what takes place here. Because Lord knows, <laughs> I don't have them all, that's for sure. So going into this year, 
What are some things you need to kill? Not people. <laughs> Back up. <laughs> things, attitudes. Some of you struggle with anger. What did God say to do to it? Kill it. Some of you struggle with being selfish. What are you supposed to do to it? Kill it. Some of you struggle with greed. Some struggle with disloyalty. Some struggle with lying. Some struggle with all of it. I can promise you this. Every one of us struggle with something. Me too. So there is no one here that's exempt. If you are, then you take here next week and I will sit back here and listen to you. I promise. We all have something in our life that needs to be fixed, that we need to put to death. And the whole process of this, and this is where I get to, Amanda, the whole process of this is God's not going to come down and do it for you. The scripture says you do it. He will give you the grace to do it. He will give you the mercy to do it. He will give you the ideas on how to do it. But guess who has to do it? You do. So the next time you feel the anger coming up, instead of punching the wall, maybe I should stop. Because the only thing that happens when you punch a wall is your hand gets sore and you have to fix the wall. Ask me how I know. <laughs> you know, you walk into work and you're all bandaged up. You've got to make some really good story up. What happened? Well, back in the war... <laughs> You don't want to look at him and say, I was an idiot. I got mad and I hit the wall. Why? Well, my two-year-old, come on. Really? Yeah. Really. So in your life, going into this new year, let's make some decisions. Let's look at what is it, God, that I need to put to death? What is it that I need to bring to the altar and lay down that I need to put away and quit doing? But then, God, I don't want to leave a void. What do I need to pick up? And what do I need to start doing? If I could replace my anger with mercy... If instead of being mad, I could come up with a solution. Lord, help me to be grace-filled with the people around me. Let me show mercy even when mercy is not deserved. Let me be thankful even when everything appears to be falling apart. Because truth of the matter is, my life's pretty good. Yeah, I have some pains. Yes, I face some challenges. Yes, there's things that go on in my life. But man, I look at my life. I mean, all you got to do is look at my seven grandbabies. Closer to home, look at my kids. I got three great kids that have grown up to be fairly responsible adults. You know how good it does your heart when you walk into town and say, that's the hardest working man I know. And they're talking about your boy. Man, am I blessed. And Lord knows my wife. Everybody wants her away from me. They all want to reopen your business. Redo the, 
find somebody to give more than she does. How blessed am I? Do I get frustrated with her? Daily. <laughs> Daily. I've been married to her for 32 years. She deserves the award most of the time. How blessed am I? Yes, there's times I go to the car and it's got a flat tire. How blessed am I? Yeah, I get up with a cold. How blessed am I? Yeah, my neck doesn't work real well. How blessed am I? Yeah, the joints hurt. An old Arthur visit sometimes. But how blessed am I? Finances might be a little tight. How blessed am I? I haven't missed too many meals. Thank you, Jesus. How blessed am I? Yeah, I got a tough report from the doctor. How blessed am I? I live in a country with some phenomenal medicine. But more importantly, I serve a God that can fix it all. Whew, how blessed am I? So what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to kill some things. I can't point them out to you. Because then they would be accusations and you'd have something else to forgive me for. <laughs> you have to do this. You've got to identify. Some of you can identify it today. You can come to the altar today. We'll pray about it. And you're started. Some of you, it's going to take some self-examination. Because some of us have a, 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 a view of ourselves that's better than it should be. Scripture talks about that. Where it says, don't see yourself more highly than you ought to. If you put it there, that means sometimes we do. Some of us just need to go back and say, God, what is it today that you require of me? What part of me are you asking me to kill? It's an interesting way to put it. Isn't it? <laughs> what part of me needs to die? So that the next part of you can come to life in me. So if you know what that thing is, Let's bring it to the altar and let's lay it down. And let's start the process. If you don't know it yet, my prayer for you is that today God brings it to your attention. Now, what does that mean? That means when you get in your car and you're driving back and the anger wells up inside of you, I'm going to say, God, stop them. That's it. When you begin to complain and murmur, I'm going to ask God, make them choke on it. Make them choke on it. Make it a bad taste in their mouth. So it's readily identifiable. And at that point, you get to make the choice. Am I willing to sacrifice this right now? And put it aside. So the altar's open, and I'm going to pray for those uh, that come. I'm going to pray for you guys that are sitting there now. If you need to go, God bless you. You can go. Uh, if you need time here, let's spend it. There's the one thing I've learned is it's important that we spend the time. 